Okay, welcome to the lecture. So in this lecture, we will talk about polynomial identity testing. Um, we will talk about uh, how to um, use polynomial identity testing to test whether a given bipartite graph has a perfect matching. And then we will see how to uh, use uh, probabilistic techniques to, uh, in order to actually output a perfect matching from a bipartite graph using a parallel process. Okay, fine. So um, I already explained uh, polynomial identity testing and its application to uh, um, perfect matching in bipartite graphs in the, I think lecture 15, but nevertheless, uh, we will go through it again. So what is polynomial identity testing? So basically we want to check whether two polynomials are, are, are identical. So basically the two polynomials may be given in two different forms like this x minus one into x plus three into x minus six. And here we have a expanded form. So these are not the only two possible forms, but you can imagine by use of multiplication and addition in different forms, you could imagine other ways of representing the polynomial. And it is not immediately clear whether these two polynomials are the same. If you look at the leading term, both of them have the leading term x cubed. And if you look at the constant term, both of them have the constant term 18. So it is not clear whether they are the same or not. And I think in this case, they turn out to be not the same because I think one is a root of the left-hand side polynomial, but one is not a root of this. So if you substitute one here, you get five minus 12 plus 18, so 23 minus 12, which is 11, right? So it is not the same. But the goal is to check whether these are the same or not. So the one way is to standardize these polynomials and compare. This will work okay in the case of polynomials like this. Like this means uh, this, is, uh, this is a single variable polynomial or a univariate polynomial. In this case, it is easy to expand and check. However, in the case of multivariate uh, polynomials where there are multiple variables, this is not uh, so easy to check. We will soon see why that is the case. So let us see one easy randomized algorithm. So basically what you do is here we substituted one and checked. So we substitute a random value on both sides and evaluate. Again, once you have values, it's easy to evaluate. Right? So if you pick a random value R from uh, a set of big size, let's say 100 times D where D is a degree, we'll soon realize why we choose 100 times the degree, why degree plays a role. Evaluate f at r and g at r and check if they are the same. If f and g are the same at r, we say that these two polynomials are identical, right? So the three lines here means that the polynomials are identical, right? And if f r is not equal to g r, so here it is two lines because it is the evaluation that we are comparing, which is just a number. Here we are comparing the polynomial itself. So if f r is equal to g r, we say the polynomials are identical. If fr is not equal to gr, we say that the polynomials are not identical. So very quickly, let us understand what is happening here. Suppose the polynomials are indeed the same polynomial. Now, whichever random value you pick, f will be, uh, you will get that fr is equal to gr because the polynomials themselves are the same. However, it, it is possible that f and g are not identically equal, but the evaluations may turn out to be equal at a, specific, at a specific point, right? So even though there are two different polynomials, maybe at a certain point, they evaluate to the same, right? Uh, for instance, x squared plus three and x squared plus x plus three. At x is equal to zero, both of these evaluate to three, right? Even though these are different polynomials. So what is the probability of error? So the error does not happen when f is identically equal to g. The error only happens, it's a one-sided error. It only happens when f is not identically equal to g. And it so happens that the r that we choose is such that f is equal to g at that r. In other words, r is a root of the difference polynomial. So you can consider the difference polynomial fr minus gr or f minus g. And evaluate R happens to be a root of that difference polynomial. So suppose F and G are of degree D. So any degree D polynomial has at most 
d roots this is what is called the fundamental theorem of algebra any polynomial like cubic polynomial has at most three roots quadratic polynomial has at most two roots so if f and g are of degree d the difference is also of degree d so it has at most d roots and we pick a big you pick the random value r from a big enough set 100d size set so the probability of us unluckily picking such a root is d divided by 100d or 1 by 100 so this is the probability of error right so that's the algorithm now you could repeat and do other things to boost the probability of error uh, probability uh, improve the probability of success or reduce the probability of error this is a so here we uh we don't we don't have false negatives but we have false positives so i think this is uh co rp mm. yes it is co rp because so we are testing whether it is identical so it it also depends on which language we define are we checking for the polynomials be identical or the che checking for the polynomials being not identical but and if you are testing for identity it is um, this is a co rp algorithm right now let us consider the multivariate case how do we how do we check this the problem with multivariate case is that we could have a lot of terms right in let's say if you have a single variable a polynomial of degree d the only in the in the in the final form we will have Let's say degree degree ten, then we could have x power ten, x power nine, x power eight, and so on. So we could end up to constant. We could have only eleven terms in the final form. But when we have multiple variables, we could there could be so many variables, and let's say uh, there could be exponentially many terms because of various combinations possible between many variables. Right? So many combinations could be possible. but let's try to see if a generalization of the above algorithm so so the, the point is that since we could since we may have many terms we may not be able to expand the uh, polynomial in the uh, and and check whether these are the same even the expanded polynomial might have too many terms for us to write down so what we can try is to attempt a generalization of the above algorithm that we saw because um even though expansion may not, may be hard evaluation at a particular point will be possible right and this is a reasonable assumption that evaluation is possible so we pick so it has n variables so we pick r1 r2 all from a set s where the set of the size of set s is 100 d like before and evaluate p at that value okay so one small thing instead of uh, checking whether f is equal to g it is equivalent to check whether f minus g is zero right so let us just talk about checking whether a polynomial is the identically equal to the zero polynomial right whether p is identically equal to the zero polynomial which is kind of the same problem f is equal to f is identically equal to g if and only if f minus g is identically equal to zero right so now the problem is to check whether this is p is identically equal to zero Now you now you evaluate p at the randomly chosen point r one r two up to r n, and then check whether the evaluation is zero. If the evaluation is zero, you declare that p is identically zero. If the evaluation is not zero, we say that it is not identically zero. Again, if the polynomial is indeed if uh, p is indeed identically the zero polynomial, um, it is easy to uh, see that. any evaluation will also lead to zero but it could it could still it could so happen that p is not identically zero but the evaluation happens to be a set of r1 r2 which evaluate to zero so what is the probability of that so as you would have seen in the previous uh, in in the in class meeting what we have here is a very convenient generalization of the de millo lipton uh, we have a convenient generalization of the fundamental theorem of algebra and this is called the de millo lipton schwarz zippel lemma right um which says that um which says that something like the fundamental theorem of algebra is true in the case of multivariate polynomials also so if p is not zero 
right? So the error happens when p is identically not zero, but the evaluation happens to be zero. So we want to limit the probability of probability of that happening. So if p is not identically zero, what is the probability that a certain r1 r2 gets evaluated to zero? Uh, the lemma says that the probability of this is at most d divided by the size of s. Again, the proof is not that difficult, but uh, I'll skip it in this lecture. And since if we set d, uh, uh, s to be size 100 d, the probability of error like before becomes 1 by 100. So uh, the point to note is that even for multivariate polynomials, um, we have a similar result. So the probability of, we can check whether a given multivariate polynomial is identically equal to zero using randomized testing like this. Basically you, <coughs> sorry, you evaluate it at a random point or maybe you repeat it two, three times or maybe a few few number of times. And this, this, this algorithm is extremely simple, right? You just, how more simple can, can it become, right? All we do is pick up some random points and evaluate it, right? And then just check whether that those points are zero. If any of them are not zero, we say that the polynomial is not zero. If all of them are zero, all the evaluations are zero, we say that the polynomial is zero. What is interesting is that there is no known polynomial time deterministic algorithm without using randomness. Right? There is no deterministic algorithm that checks for multivariate polynomial identity testing. Okay, so now um, let me go to an application of this, which is bipartite matching. So that's, this is a bipartite graph here. You have, uh, which means you can partition the vertices into two sets, a uh, left side and right side. And all the edges are from, uh, are from the left side to the right side, right? And we can write the adjacency matrix like this. So the, the left side corresponds to rows. So a has an edge to one and five. So the row A has an edge to one and five fifth column. B has edge to first and second column. C has edge to two, three, four, five. D does not have any outgoing edges and E has just one edge to the first vertex here. Now, what is a perfect matching? A perfect matching is a set of edges such that every edge, every vertex participates in exactly one edge. Every vertex participates in exactly one edge. And let me just say that this graph does not have a perfect matching because D, there are no outgoing edges from D or there are no edges from D. So we cannot get a neighbor for D. D cannot participate in any edge. So let us just see another example where we add one more edge to D. And this graph has a perfect matching. So you can, I hope you can see the shaded lines here, the other edges. This graph has a perfect matching. Um, the bold black edges being the perfect matching. So every vertex participates in exactly one edge. A participates in one edge, B participates, no uh, B participates in one edge, C participates in one edge and so on. And so on for one, two, three, four, five. No edge participates in more than one, no edge part, sorry, no vertex participates in more than one or less than one, right? And uh, I'm representing the the, the corresponding um, entries in the adjacency matrix. So A goes to five, which is here, B goes to two, C goes to three, D goes to four, and E goes to one. So this corresponds to the, correspond, uh, the, the entries, the corresponding to the perfect matching in the adjacency matrix. Now you can see what is happening here. There is another way to see it is that every row has exactly one, one, and every column has exactly one, one. So G, this graph G has a perfect matching. If we can choose a subset of ones from this matrix, such that every row and every column has exactly one, one each, right? No row has more, uh, like one, one in the sense, one selected one. Of course, there are more edges that give you more ones, but the, the chosen ones are uh, the ones in bold, right? So we should be able to select a subset of ones such that every row and every column has exactly one one in that subset. So in other words, it's called a permutation. 
right? You have uh, for every like the first row you pick the last column, second row you pick the second column. So every row corresponds to uh, corresponding to every row you pick a column, right? This is what is happening here. And no row get the same column, and all rows get at least one column. So for every row you have a bijection or a permutation, right? It's a permutation of the uh, of the set one to n, right? So here. One is mapped to five, two is mapped to two, three is mapped to three, three, four is mapped to four, and five is mapped to one. So one easy way of checking, or one way of checking whether G has a perfect matching, is to look for such permutations and see. So in this case, this permutation has all ones. Check whether there is any permutation where all the entries uh, are corresp uh, correspond to. Uh, non-zero values. So you sum over all the permutations possible, and for the permut each permutation, you take the product of the entries. So the ith, um, ith row, and the sigma i. Sigma is the notation for the permutation. Sigma i column. The entry is it corresponding to a non-zero value, and then you take the product of that. So here the product of all ones will be one. And then you sum up for all the permutations. So if there are multiple perfect matchings, this the value of this will be higher, right? So in this case, I think there is only one perfect matching. It's not that difficult to see. Basically, D has only one edge, and once D's neighbor is fixed, C uh, okay, C has more than one option. But okay, you can reason. E has only one neighbor, and then once E's neighbor is fixed, A has only one other neighbor. And then we have just B and C, which can only uh, have two and three. Anyway, you can see that yourself. But this is the quantity. So graph has a perfect matching if and only if the summation over all the permutations, the product of all the entries in the permutation, should be non-zero. And this happens to be a, a well-known quantity uh, corresponding to a square matrix. Uh, it is called the permanent of a matrix. And it is known that the, this quantity permanent is not very easy to compute. So it is known that it is something called uh, sharp p hard, which you may see later in the course. So permanent is not easy to compute. So permanent actually gives you the when you have a zero one adjacency matrix, this gives you the number of perfect matchings, right? Because each perfect matching, like here, the product gives you one. So if you have multiple perfect matchings, it gives you the number of perfect matchings in a bipartite graph. So, it, but it is. It happens to be not so easy to compute. So, what can we do? Right. The problem is now. Wh now, what we can do is what is what we do is we can introduce a sign here. So, each permutation has this concept called sign. We can in introduce a sign thing here. So, everything is the same except that we introduce a sign here, and now this becomes a very familiar quantity to all of us. If you just add a sign here, that is, depending on whether it's an odd or even permutation, we add a plus or minus here, right? A factor of plus or minus. This becomes what is called the determinant. Right? This is extremely familiar to all of us. Now, this is the formula for the determinant. Now, we could check whether the determinant is non-zero, but there is a small problem. What if the graph has two perfect matchings? And the sign of these two perfect matchings cancel each other, so the determinant will be zero, right? But um, but but there are perfect matchings. But if there are no perfect matchings, determinant will still be zero. But the determinant can could be zero even when there are perfect matchings because the signs cancel out, right? Even when there are perfect matchings, the determinant could be zero. So what we do is instead of taking the zero one matrix like here. We look at what is called the Tut matrix, where we have where we replace each of the ones with variables like this x11, x15, x21, x22, and so on. Right? These are all variables, and because these are variables, you cannot cancel out. the 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 term corresponding to a certain permutation cannot be the term corresponding corresponding to another permutation because all of these variables are different. x11 is different from x15, and so on. All of these are different, so no cancellation can happen. So now, but then this is a this is a polynomial form. The determinant will be a polynomial formed out of these variables. 
so g has a perfect matching if and only if the corresponding determinant uh, is not identically zero so the determinant is not a uh, the determinant is not a uh, a number but it is a polynomial instead okay just one second okay so what happens is when we replace uh, the 0 1 by this variables we get the g has a perfect matching if and only if the determinant is not identically zero right so now because it's a polynomial there is no way for it to cancel terms so if it has a perfect matching then uh, the determinant cannot be zero the zero polynomial right and now this now the determinant is a polynomial right it's just a a bunch of all these terms added and multiplied together and you can check whether this determinant is a polynomial by using the polynomial identity testing uh, using the short zippel de mello lipton like we saw earlier right so this is one application of uh, polynomial identity testing okay now we will now we will see how to output a perfect matching and this will involve what is called isolation lemma which is a very interesting and uh, exciting result that that came out about 30 years back 30 35 years back and okay another thing that i have to say is that uh, uh, say is that um, uh, this is not the only algorithm for computing whether a graph has a perfect matching there are many algorithms right there are many such algorithms this is just uh, uh, this is just one algorithm and it is interesting and there are many det deterministic algorithm using max flow theory and so on right <coughs> right so now we will see how to do outputting uh, like how to output a perfect matching right so earlier we saw how to decide whether a graph has a perfect matching now we will see how to output a perfect matching in parallel uh using the same similar techniques um we already saw in one of the earlier lectures about self reducibility self reducibility means um like uh, given an oracle where that that tells us whether uh, a formula is satisfiable or not we use that to construct a satisfying assignment similarly using this decision version uh, of checking whether a graph has a perfect matching can we actually construct a perfect matching right so this can be done uh, which is not very hard but the self reducibility is a sequential process right so if you recall the proof went uh, one by one uh, for each variable but um, what we will do here is that we want a parallel procedure we are looking for a parallel procedure and we'll see how to get a perfect matching out, how to output a perfect matching in parallel right using randomization um using randomization how to output a perfect perfect matching in parallel right so we'll see how to have how this uh, how this is done so for this we first require what is called isolation lemma so which was actually invented or discovered to uh, actually prove the same result in 87 by mulmale wazirani and wazirani okay the statement is very simple and easy to understand i mean the proof is very simple and easy to understand so let x be a set of n elements small n elements and let script f right this fancy font f be a family of the subsets of x okay script f is a family of subsets of x x has small n elements now uh, consider a weight function called w where we assign weights to all the elements of x right each element of x is given a, a weight the weight is is from the range 1 to capital n so you should think of capital n as some number that is much bigger than small n and each w uh, each element in capital x is randomly given uh, a value in this set and independently given a value in this x so all of like it can get 1 with probability 1 by capital n 2 with probability 1 by capital n 3 with probability 1 by capital n and so on 
right? It is independent and uniformly at random. In that case, in that case, now what we are trying to estimate is what is the probability that there is a unique uh, set in script F. So recall script F is a family of subsets such that that has minimum weight. Right. So now you can think of the weight of each set. Right. So a weight of a set in script F is the uh, sum of the weights of the elements. So what is the probability? So now you can think of the weight of each set F capital F in script F. Now what? Now you can look at the minimum weight such set. Right. So these are all um, each set. So what is the maximum weight any set can have? So if all uh, if if the entire set X is there, and if all the elements of X are uh, given the value capital N, then that that will be that set will have weight small n times capital N. This is the maximum in weight any set can attain. So what is a what can we say about the minimum weight set uh, in script F? In particular, is this minimum weight set unique? Is there a unique minimum weight set right are there two so i don't want two sets to have the minimum weight i want only one set to have the minimum weight right this is my requirement what is the probability of this happening and the probability of this happening is at least 1 minus small n divided by capital n so if you set capital n to be something like 100 small n then this becomes 99 percentage which is which is what we want and we'll see why this is going to be helpful for us, right? So let us define what is called alpha small x for a point small x in capital X, right? Let us define alpha small x. What is alpha small x? So consider the weight of all the sets in script F, all those sets that do not contain x, right? Alpha is a function of small x. Consider the weight of all the sets that do not contain X. Okay. And uh, what is the minimum amongst those? And then consider the weight of all the sets that do contain X, that contain X, but you remove X from them, right? So consider all the sets in script F that contain X and you remove X from them. Now, what is the weight of the resulting set? So, FR, capital FR, those sets in script F that contain X. And then you remove the element small x from them and you consider the minimum of that. Now, notice that alpha x is independent of the weight of x. Right? It, it does not have any bearing on the weight of x because this term is only comprising of the weights of other values in capital X, not the small x. And even this, uh, this term comprises of uh, the weight of other values because X, even though we are considering sets capital F in script, we are explicitly removing small x in this weight. So both of these are independent of the weight of small x. Now, suppose we compute alpha x, which is anyway independent of the weight of x. And now we are checking whether the weight of x is equal to alpha x. What is the probability? So the weight of x is randomly chosen from n values 1, 2, 3, 4 up to n. Now the weight of x being equal to any specific value, in particular it, it being equal to alpha x, is at most 1 divided by the number of choices, which is capital F, right? And this is, we are making use of the fact that this is independent. So now what is the probability that, what is the probability that uh, for some X in one, uh, in capital X, the weight of X is equal to alpha X. So for a specific X, the weight of X being e equal to alpha X is one divided by N. What is the probability that for some x, the weight of x is equal to alpha x, right? The probability of this is n at most n by n because 
it is just the union of the probability of the first value uh, being equal to for the first x this being equal to alpha union the prob this is equal to alpha for the second x and so on so there are n such values x and this is the probability that the the weight is equal to alpha for that x is an x such that the weight is equal to alpha okay so now the probability of there existing an x for which the weight being equal to alpha is at most small n divided by capital n we will show that if the minimum so recall the goal is to show that there is a unique minimum weight uh, uh, set in script f with high probability we will now show that if the minimum weight set is not unique then there is an x with alpha equal to weight and the probability of there being such an x is small n divided by capital n so therefore the probability of the minimum weight set not being unique is small n divided by capital n okay so now all that remains to be shown is that is that the if the minimum weight set is not unique uh, there exists an x for which w is equal to alpha so let's see how to show that suppose there are it is not unique let's say there are two minimum weight sets a and b now if there are two minimum weight sets a and b then there has to be some x that is in a but not in b and there is some x that is right or some x in that is not in b but not in a something has to be there otherwise if all the x's are there in a and also in b then these sets will be the same right so you consider such an x that is in a but not in b now let us look at the definition of uh definition of alpha right now let's look at the first term minimum weight of f sorry uh minimum weight of f uh such that f is in f and x is not in f so we know that x is an element that is not in b and we know that b is a minimum weight set so the minimum among all sets that do not contain x will be attained by b and minimum amongst all sets that contain x will be attained by a right so the minimum of all f such that h x is in f is w a but now we are removing x from all of that but and so we, uh, we have to remove the weight of x which will be subtract uh, w x so the minimum of the second term in the in the alpha computation is this so what was alpha alpha is the first term minus second term so wb minus wa plus wx so since wb and wa are both the same this means that alpha x is equal to the weight of x so if both a and b are minimum weight sets both of them have the same weight and hence wx is equal to alpha x right so the weight of x will be equal to alpha x so you pick the element that is in one of the minimum weight sets and that for that element the weight will be equal to the alpha right right so and for and we know that the probability of for any x w being equal to alpha is at most n by n or or there existing an x for which w is equal to alpha is n by n and hence uh the probability of uh, there not being any unique uh, there being a unique minimum weight uh, f is at least 1 minus n by n okay so the statement is again consider a family of sets script f which are all subsets of the set capital x now right set x has n elements small n elements now we assign a weight function randomly to all the elements in x now we look at the minimum weight set which is in the family f what is the probability that there is a unique minimum weight set in script f this probability is at least 1 minus n by n and now we are going to use that 
to output a perfect matching in parallel. Okay, so let us see how to output the perfect matching in parallel. So suppose we have given the adjacency matrix A of the graph. Now what we do first is to assign values 1, 2, 3 up to 2 times E. Okay, so capital E cardinality is a number of edges. So we assign random values out of this set for each edge. Right, so WE is a random value and we, we write this matrix. So recall we had the stud matrix. So now instead of x11, x15 and so on, we write 2 power w11, 2 power w15, 2 power w21 and so on, where um, w11, w215, etc. correspond to each edge and the weights that were chosen randomly from this. Right? And let us call this matrix B. Okay, this is the first step. And what we do is we compute the determinant of this matrix. Okay, so till now there is no parallel. Right? We compute the determinant of this. If the determinant is zero, that means there is no perfect, or that means there is no, uh, we say that there is no perfect matching. Okay. Um, and if the determinant is not zero, we compute the largest R such that 2 power R divides the determinant. Okay. And then we do the following in parallel. For each edge, what we do is we set, we change the value of that uh, entry to zero. So let us take uh, W, uh, the edge one, one. So you make this entry zero. And then that, that, that is called the matrix B subscript E, right? Corresponding to the um, edge E, right? You set the entry equal to zero. And you compute the determinant of B subscript E. If the determinant of B subscript E is 0, then you output E. If it is not 0, you compute the largest value R E such that you compute the largest value R E such that 2 power R E divides the determinant of B E. Right? Just like we computed R earlier, we compute this. Now, if this R or if this RE is strictly greater than R, you output E. If this RE is not greater, if it is uh, equal to or something, then you don't output that, that edge. So all this is done happening in parallel for each edge. So you could have n squared parallel processes going on, right? Where each one of them for each edge, you, uh, uh, B E is computed, R E is computed and R E is compared with R. And then depending on that, uh, that edge is output or not output. Right? Right. So, and the claim is that um, this, this works. Right, this, the edges are, you notice that the edges are parallelly output, they are output in parallel. They are not output together, they are output in parallel. But the, 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 if the randomness has helped us, with good probability, we will be correctly outputting a perfect matching. So what is the randomness here? So the randomness just purely comes from the isolation lemma. If there is a unique, so think of the weights being uh, uh, these numbers that are randomly chosen and the sets being perfect matching, right? So X will correspond to the set of all edges and perfect matching, each perfect matching is a collection of edges. So think of each weight being uh, each per set of perfect matching given a weight and think about uh, what is the probability of having a minimum weight perfect matching, a unique minimum weight perfect matching, right? So so we, in place of small n here, we have the size of the edges, number of edges. In place of capital N, we have twice the number of edges. So small n divided by capital N is half here. So what we have here is that with probability uh, at least half, right? One minus n by n, there is a unique min weight perfect matching. 
right? And that will be, so if there is a unique mean weight perfect matching, the rest of the proof will be clear. If we happen to have not get unique mean weight perfect matching, then we can repeat till we get a perfect matching. Given a, once we obtain a perfect matching, it is easy, or once we obtain a, any set, it is easy to verify that it is a perfect matching. So if it is not a perfect matching, we could just run it again. And we could, and the probabilities will work out for themselves. Right? So let us consider the earlier perfect matching. And uh, let us consider the earlier perfect matching that we had earlier. So I have the circled vertices here. Some, some vertices are circled, right? Um, what is the contribution of this perfect matching in the determinant, right? This perfect matching will contribute this product, 2 power w15 multiplied by 2 power w22, multiplied by 2 power w33, w44, 2 power w51, etc. right? So it's a product, but a product of these things will, will, will result in a sum in the, in the exponent. And in addition, there will be a sign plus minus, right? So in addition, there will be a sign. So that means uh, this matching contributes plus minus uh, or sign times two power the weight of the matching, right? So if you think of the weight of the matching as the sum of the weights of the edges, it is two power this. And this is the contribution to the determinant, right? And by isolation lemma in step one, with probability half, there is a unique min weight perfect matching. Right? This I already explained. And the rest of the proof works assuming that there is a unique min weight perfect matching. Okay. Okay, as I was saying, uh, the rest of the algorithm works assuming that there is a unique min weight perfect matching. Right. If there is a unique min weight perfect matching, everything will work out. So let's say W is the weight of the unique minimum weight perfect matching. Um, and um, okay, so there is a small error here. All right. So two power W divides determinant of B because for all the other ma matchings um, m prime, uh, the weight of m prime will be strictly greater than w. So, so which means at least w plus one. So correspondingly, the weight of all of them will be, uh, the, the, the contribution to the determinant will be at least plus minus two power w plus one, right? So there'll be plus minus here. So all the other terms in the determinant will be a multiple of two power w plus one and uh, 2 power w will be just plus minus 2 power w. So uh, the determinant of p will be 2 power w times an odd number because for the minimum weight perfect matching, which is a unique minimum weight perfect matching, uh, the contribution is 2 power w plus minus. And for all the other matchings, the contribution is plus minus 2 power w plus 1 at least. So it will be the, it will be 2 times at least two times a multiple of two power w. So it will all result in an even number. So again, some uh, adding even number, subtracting even number, uh, it doesn't matter, we'll still get an even number, right? So the largest power of two that divides the determinant of b will be consequently two power w. And this w is also the uh, size of the, or the weight of the unique min weight perfect matching. So the, the R that, is, that we determined over here, uh, that divides uh, the highest uh, number, such that two power R divides the determinant of B, is nothing but the weight of the unique min weight perfect matching. Okay, so now that we understood, now let us see how uh, the remaining parallel uh, edges that are output, which are being output without consulting with each other, right? So these are all parallel process. You do, you compute BE and then you do some bunch of things and then you output. And this is done independently. How are we able to independently output? How are we able to independently output um, uh, the matching? Uh, which uh, That is what remains to be seen. 
Now let us see what happens. So now you remove each edge in parallel and again compute the minimum weight perfect matching. So basically, let's say for instance, two power uh, W11, let's say if you remove, what happens is now this edge is removed and you, and meaning removed meaning replaced by zero. And again, suppose this, the red circled one is a unique mean weight perfect matching. So in which case, the unique mean weight perfect matching is retained in the graph. Whereas if it was this edge that was removed, uh, which is actually a part of the unique mean weight perfect matching, when one when we remove this, um, we will the, the graph will look at uh, another. Um, there are two possibilities. One possibility is that the graph does not have any perfect matching, which is the case here. Or the other possibility is that it has a perfect matching, which is not min weight, because this is the unique min weight perfect matching by assumption. So we know for sure that the, the, any other perfect matching in this graph, once you make this zero, will have a higher weight, right? So there are two possibilities. So if E is in the minimum, minimum weight perfect matching, then the term corresponding to the minimum weight perfect matching vanishes. So the determinant of B will be two power R times two B. So basically this, this one vanishes. So it will be two power uh, R or two power W times two B, which means the smallest uh, power of two that divides determinant of BE will be at least R plus one. So it will be strictly greater than R. So R E, which is the smallest power that divides determinant B computed in 4C will be at least, will be strictly greater than R. Uh, it is also possible that there is no min weight perfect matching apart from the single perfect matching. There's only one matching, which also is unique because it's only one matching. In which case determinant of B will be zero, right? In which case the determinant of B, so because you, there was only one matching and you removed an edge, so there are no more perfect matchings. But if E was in the, not in the unique min weight perfect matching, then removing E does not make a difference. The unique min weight perfect matching still, uh, still stays. So the RE will still be the same as R because uh, maybe some terms here that contribute this to the small B vanish, but still it will be two power W times one plus two B or two B dash, let's say, where B dash is a different integer. Right? So it will still be two power W will be the largest number. So RE will be still be equal to R. So if there is a unique min weight perfect matching, either we will have RE greater than R or determinant of BE will be uh, zero. So if we get a such an instance, then the above algorithm, even though it happens parallelly, right? All these BE computations and this checking is happening parallelly. It is able to output uh, an edge, which is part of the unique min weight perfect matching, right? So, um, and, and then uh, collectively that is enough. So what we are doing is we use this uh, isolation lemma to kind of isolate one of the many perfect matching. Suppose there are many perfect matching. We use the isolation lemma to isolate one perfect matching. The, the random weights make sure that one of the perfect matchings has the unique minimum weight, minimum weight. And then that minimum weight, uh, the existence of such a unique min weight perfect matching is being used or is being exploited here to get a parallel algorithm. Again, th this is also um, uh, when we learn circuits and later in the course, we will see how uh, this is significant because um, when we learn circuits, we'll see how this is significant because uh, this, um, this parallel algorithm can be viewed in the terms of a particular NC um, in the NC1 hierarchy, in the NC hierarchy, uh, being in the parallel, which is a circuit model that captures this. Um, so what we, again, just to summarize, we, we went through the, the polynomial identity testing. We saw how we can use the identity testing to test whether there is a perfect matching, right? Basically using that to uh, check the determinant of the third matrix. Then we saw how to parallelly output a perfect matching. So first, if there are multiple perfect matchings, we make sure there is a unique minimum weight perfect matching. So this can be done by randomly assigning values. And the proof is really simple and small, but interesting, elegant. And then we have this uh, algorithm, 
again this algorithm is also by mulmulay wazirani and wazirani uh, who uh, first compute determinant of b and then compute determinant of be in parallel and then use that to output the uh, edges in parallel and collectively these edges will form uh, the unique min weight perfect matching which is just anyway the unique min weight thing was a artificial thing constructed by us so so as to make the algorithm work but we will get a perfect matching yes so that's about it for this lecture so thank you